Hey, photographers, welcome to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz, and really I'm just here to help you build a sustainable photography business. That certainly means helping you improve your photographic skills and enabling you to become a stronger business owner, but it also means helping you work more efficiently so you don't get burnt out in the long run. We are sponsored by PhotographersEdit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and Milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing. All right, let's get into today's episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca Podcast episode. And Tanya is here with me. And Tanya, for some reason, I feel like we I'd had you on the podcast in the past and, and we haven't. So I appreciate mm-hmm. you making time to hang out with me today. Yeah, I'm excited. I was thinking about the first time I met you. It was at WPPI like a long time ago. Super long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, you're just like standing in your booth there and I introduced myself and we chatted and then connected on Facebook. So <laughs> Well, I'm glad that we can make this happen. We're going to actually get into a topic today that we've touched on in the past. Uh, we've, we've talked about branding photography in the past, but this is an interesting angle and certainly a unique one that we haven't delved into to date. And that is specifically creating recurring revenue uh, with branding photography. So we're going to get to that discussion in just a little bit. But because you are brand new on the show, I want to ask some of the more uh, common questions that we ask to each of the guests that come on this show. And the first one has to do with brand position. And, and we'll get into this specifically with regards to your photography business. Um, what enables your business to stand out in your local marketplace? So, well, number one, I specialize specifically and only in branding photography. I only work with businesses. And I mean, I feel like I'm the only one around here that does that. Everyone else, you know, also does weddings and families and babies and whatever. Right. Uh, you know. So if someone asks on social media for a business photographer, I get tagged by 20 or 30 people because I'm known for that. And I worked really hard to uh, become known for that. And my background is in graphic design and branding. So I knew that was going to be helpful for me if I specialized in one thing and became known for one thing. Yeah. You know, specialization isn't kind of the end all be all necessarily, but I think it makes a massive difference. And I've told this story before in the podcast, but for any newer listeners, I remember as a wedding photographer, I used to go to these networking events and and it was kind of amusing to me. It still is honestly. Um, but when I think about the responses that other photographers attending those networking meetings would give and they would go something like, Hey, I'm so-and-so I specialize in, and then they would list like five different types of photography, you know, weddings and portraits and seniors. And, and the reality of course, is if you're doing five different types of photography, you're not actually specializing really in any one of them. Specialization in a very noisy kind of crowded industry enables us to more effectively stand out. So I love that you're doing something different from those in your marketplace, which by the way, is, is what market we're, we're about to be based I'm in Spokane, Washington, so it's on the easternmost side of Washington State. So Northern Idaho is also part of my A market. Okay, and and I'm on the homepage of your your photography website for everybody listening. And if you go to workstoryphotography.com, just like it sounds, um, the brand position is very clear, front and center. Elevate your brand image with storytelling photos that sell. How did you come up with that position statement? Um, lots of work and playing around with it. I guess yeah. over figure out, you know, what my clients want and the value that I offer them. Um, A new slogan I've come up with this year is we make brands look like a million bucks, (laughs) you know, just that kind of, I'm always trying to play with new ones, but that seems to be, you know, that's what we do for people. So. Well, I I like this position statement because it, I mean, there's, there are a variety of things that you could do with it potentially from a marketing standpoint, you're talking about elevating or lifting up the brand image, that whole that has a whole line of thought that you can run with, and then storytelling photos. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that that phrase in just a little bit, but storytelling photos that sell that's a whole line of thought that you could run with. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a really powerful statement. By the way, for anybody listening in, you know we've talked about this almost endlessly in the past, but 
we actually have here, Tanya has actually posted her brand position statement above the fold on the homepage of her site in large font so that you can't miss it. It's the, literally the first thing that you see when you get there. So a potential client isn't confused about the service being offered and how it's unique to the other photographers in the industry or in comparison to the other photographers in the industry, that local industry there. And so I think this is a really wonderful example of a brand position statement. For those of you listening in, go to workstoryphotography.com. You can check that out. Let me jump to the next question, though, Tanya. Um, we're talking about customer experience. And as cliche a topic as, as this may feel like to many, um, I think it's worth continuing to delve into. And, and I love getting the perspective of a variety of photographers on this. What has been the most important idea for you behind providing a really great customer experience? Yeah, so finding out what my customers want was a process. And I mean, that's what really what you want to offer, right, is what they want. So um, different than like traditional portrait photography where like a family or, you know, a woman or something wants to come in and spend all day. My clients are professionals. They are often paying their team to be there for a photo shoot. They want to get it done quickly. They want it done right. They want a result that is going to be usable for them in their marketing and advertising. So coming up with a very efficient system and, you know, streamlining the process, um, walking them through the whole thing, because oftentimes, I mean, they're mostly small businesses that I work with. They've never had a photo shoot or they had one before and it was a disaster because there was no one to guide them through the process. So, you know, considering all of those things, that's, that's the experience that I offer to my clients. So we get it done right. I guide them through. Um, and they have amazing images for their marketing that hopefully help them make more money. But it starts with finding out what they want. And and this is mm-hmm. an interesting line of thought. Again, I think I even took as a photographer, wedding photographer, kind of took the position, which was um, there's a particular look and style that I'm going to deliver my clients. And if they fit into that thought process or that position or that style, then then that's great. If not, then they're not really for me. I love the emphasis that you're putting on making sure you're actually delivering what your clients want. What do you think the balance though is between that idea and then also making sure that you're maintaining some type of a position as far as the the type of or style of service that you're offering? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, a hundred percent, I'm going to create images that are technically good. (laughs) Sure. Sure. No matter what. Um, But we do talk about that in our strategy consultation, you know, is there any specific style that you like? I have one client. Um, they only want black and white photography for mm. their marketing. That's they have kind of a um, high high end luxury um, real estate brokerage, and that's one re- one one way that they stand out in their advertising is they do all black and white. So I just okay. know that. In a, you know, I've worked with them several times. For the most part, my style is pretty you know, bright. I like colors. They stand out in marketing and, you know, people can go to my website and see my style's pretty consistent, but I'm always going to tailor it to their brand image, you know, and we do talk about colors and we talk about iconography and stuff, which we'll get to more a little bit in the storytelling <laughs> part. Well, I'm actually uh, on the Instagram page uh, for your site and I'm, I'm noticing, I mean, you talk about the significance of storytelling, um, and, and ultimately, the cool thing about that position, again, and something we didn't talk about earlier when it comes to brand position, is it does give you a lot of flexibility in, in that, you know, you're not saying I'm a black and white brand photographer, for example, mm-hmm. or I'm a color uh, f- photograph or photography brand photographer. You're saying you your brand elevates brand image or other brands images with storytelling photos itself. And the cool thing is, in this context, in the context of this particular case, It could be black and white, or it could be color, Mm -hmm. or it could be the Mm -hmm. style of that, because it all still fits under the umbrella of that position statement. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Right. I think that's great. But I was was mentioning your Instagram account. For everybody listening in, it's just Instagram.com slash workstoryphotography. We'll link to that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Um, this is a little bit of an aside, but I, I'm as I'm scrolling through, I'm definitely noticing a really strong emphasis on color. You talked about the significance of color for your brand, mm-hmm. and there are definitely colors here that pop. But I'm also noticing that that a lot of your Instagram is kind of a behind the scenes versus being used as a portfolio, like a lot of photographers do. What was your thought process behind that? Yeah, I've gone back and forth on that. I feel like 
I don't get a lot of clients from Instagram. At least I have it. I more at like LinkedIn and Facebook. Okay. Um, so, you know, for a while I was like, should it be a portfolio? Should I be sharing educational content? Should it be behind the scenes? <laughs> so I've kind of tried uh, everything. A variety. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've, I have kind of used it as a behind the scenes. And I, I get a lot of engagement on the pictures of me, which I mean, that's what I teach my clients to do, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, you know, you got to show you and your people. And then I just lately, I've kind of like the next couple months, I'm going to try using it more of showcasing my clients and, and their work. So, okay. but yeah, in my case, it's kind of confusing, right? Because I'm showcasing other people's brands, but I also need to showcase my brand. So yeah, in, in the Instagram world, I've been just experimenting with different stuff. It's definitely different than like wedding photography where photographers are showing these gorgeous, amazing, uh, you know, sweeping sunset images and stuff. Because sometimes my images I create for people are, you know, it's dentists. They're like, or you know, <laughs> lawyers, you know, They're, it's not super exciting. Not sweeping but, scenic shots with a dentist yeah, before yeah. Okay. So, but it's showing their, their people, their office, their yeah. story. it works in their marketing. So yeah, I've struggled to know how to use those specifically in my marketing. Well, um, I, I think consistency is important, certainly to minimize confusion for a potential mm-hmm. client when they want to, to kind of determine internally, whether it's conscious or subconscious, what your brand's about. But at the right. same time, I also think about those Instagram accounts that you're referring to that are, you know, super consistent in the color palette and, and style ultimately what's weird about that as pretty as it can be is it all kind of starts to run together as well. Right. So there's, I think there's something to be said for a bit of variety, uh, Mm -hmm. mixing things up a little bit. Maybe, maybe it would generate a different kind of interest from a potential client. I'm not sure, but uh, good luck with the continued experimentation. Right. Right. Yeah. I guess I'm just telling my story, you know, like here's what I'm doing and here are my clients and that's, that's what I specialize in. So I'm just, doing it on my Instagram too. But talk to me about time. Um, and, and this is something that we discuss quite a bit here at the podcast, but managing time more effectively so that we mm. have a life outside of, you know, sitting at a laptop or a desktop and processing images and responding to emails. Is there a particular tip trick technique that has enabled you to create more free time for yourself? Yeah. So well, I have three young kids at home too. And that one of the main reasons I chose this type of photography is because I wanted to work during business hours, right? Like I tried wedding photography. I, I did not like being gone all weekend um, and having our entire summer filled up with work. Uh, so I have, yeah, one of the main reasons I chose this was for that, you know, I, all my kids were approaching school age. I knew I could work while they were at school. Um, but I've also learned how to plan really effectively, follow through with my plan, get rid of anything that's not essential, um, outsource things that are not my wheelhouse or that I don't like to do. Yeah. All of those things. <laughs> so a couple of questions you talked about filtering out those things that aren't essential to your business. Can you be more specific? Explain to our listeners how you go about that. Because I think a lot of us, myself included, despite the fact that I'm obsessive, uh, kind of an obsessive minimalist, if you will, I, I, I don't like a lot of moving parts in my day-to-day life professionally, mm-hmm. personally, um, I can, I'm sure I could still stand to get rid of some things that aren't absolutely essential. How did you go about that process? Yeah. So I guess it just, you know, in evaluating my time, like I only have so many hours in the day, um, what's taking up time that isn't getting a result for me. So I started out doing a lot of in-person networking, which I think was essential at the time because I was an unknown <laughs> in my city. Uh, and this is a kind of a small town vibe city where everyone has lived here their whole life yeah. all their cousins live here you know so i needed to go out and meet people and that was great at first but eventually it was just taking so much time and i didn't have time to do my work so i started cutting way back on those kind of events and i'm still reaping the benefit from all that stuff that i did in the beginning sure all the networking you know i i know people now so i was able to cut that out and then, I mean, I, I hardly have a social life <laughs> at this point outside of my business. Like my business is my social life, right? Okay. Meeting with my clients, um, that kind of thing. Cause you know, my kids and my husband and my business are my focus. So just choosing, you know, like, do I want to go to lunch with girls or do I want to book some clients and work on my business <laughs> and I choose my business. So, but you know, everyone gets to choose what's important to them. And it's true. 
Yeah. At but, this point in my life, the social stuff isn't as important. But I, I think I think it's great that you highlight that because you know we we spent quite a bit of time here on the podcast and and we'll continue to do so actually talking about this idea of a big picture view, kind of the overarching set of goals that drive us personally, which naturally then should drive us professionally. And mm-hmm. when you talk about what's essential, realistically, at the end of the day, we can't filter out those things which are not essential if we aren't clear about what it is that we're trying to accomplish right now, mm-hmm. in the next six months, year, five years, 10 years. If we haven't actually taken the time to consider that, then it becomes a bit haphazard. We do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, hope this thing works. And and, and it's we're just not near as effective as a business owner. And certainly we won't have the kind of flexibility that we may want to have as business owners because what we're doing doesn't it isn't driven by intention. So mm-hmm. have you is that something that you've done? Are, are you you've taken the time to sit down and kind of clearly outline your goals? Because when you talk about choosing right now business and family over having much of a social life, it seems like there's quite a bit of intention there. Um, what's the the end thought process in that? Yeah, I actually spent uh, the first six months of this year working with a productivity coach, which was ironic because we were in the middle of (laughs) COVID-19. Right. (laughs) Things were totally shut down. Right. Uh, But um, yeah, she helped me define those things. You know, what are the most important things to me and what do I need to add and what do I need to take away? And I added, um, like, I hired a personal trainer because I noticed my, my health was going downhill, you know, like, and I needed the accountability of that you know, that kind of thing. So, and, you know, I defined my priorities and designed my schedule around those things that are most important to me. So yeah, totally intentional, even hired someone to help me figure it out. (laughs) That's cool. Well, and I would encourage everybody listening in to, to consider this as well. If you haven't taken the time to, for those of you listening, in fact, maybe Haley, we can have Haley link to a couple of the related episodes around this idea of a big picture review in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. If you haven't heard those, Take the time, you know, this weekend, for example, uh, or maybe you're listening on the weekend. If, you, if you're in the weekend, you've got an hour or two extra, it, pull out a notebook or I use Evernote personally for my note taking and just jot down some of your kind of big picture goals for your personal life. And that's actually where it should start. And that should then drive what you're trying to accomplish with your business life, your professional life. And let those big ideas drive what you do. And the cool thing about that is it enables you to filter out those activities, those tasks, those moving parts in your day-to-day life and business um, that aren't absolutely essential to reaching those big picture goals. I'm really glad that you highlighted that, Tanya. Um, But you mentioned delegating as well. What elements Mm -hmm. of your business are you currently delegating? Yeah, so my bookkeeping and accounting for sure. (laughs) Yes. Uh, That took a huge weight off my shoulders. I have a cleaning service, Come Clean My House, twice a month, which is also amazing. I hired a a virtual assistant this year to do some administrative stuff for me. And then I have a videographer and video editor because we do video as well. Mm -hmm. And I started doing it myself and I found like the video projects were the ones that I kept putting off, (laughs) like procrastinating, you know, because I'm like, it's not my zone of genius, you know? And so I finally hired it. You know, I have someone that comes and works with me. I act more as the script writer and the director and producer and he does everything else and it's so awesome so and i don't outsource my editing for the most part but i advise don't judge too harshly here (laughs) well i mean the only reason is because i love doing it like it's one of my favorite parts yeah um and i am not i only book one or two shoots a week so i'm able to still do that part you know i outsource the other stuff that i don't like to do so i advise my students because i i have a course and i do some one-on-one mentoring I advise them, you know, if they're getting caught up in the editing and it's tripping them up, you know, if they aren't able to get their images to their client in a week, they should just outsource it, you know, if they hate doing it. So I think what you guys offer is uh, fantastic, an amazing service. Well, but you gave a whole list of things that you're already, already delegating. And, and I yeah. don't think that's the case for many, if not most photographers. Right. Um, and and yeah. so I, I love that you're, high, you're prioritizing delegation anyway. Uh, and you actually mentioned the VA. I'm curious, you know, part of when it comes to delegating editing, this is a particularly tricky element of delegation, the idea of communicating what it is that you want to an editor mm-hmm. so that the end result at least somewhat matches or mostly matches what it is that you would normally produce for a mm-hmm. client. When it comes to working with a VA, that process of learning how to communicate what it is that you want to that VA, was that was that a bit challenging? Was that a learning curve? How did How did you go about that process? Yeah, it's been a process. This is the first year I've had one. And at first, you know, I'd be like, do this thing. And then 
she wouldn't know how to do it or yeah. it wouldn't get done how I wanted it. Yeah. So I figured out if I came up with the process first, made like a training video and then, or gave very specific instructions and then passed it off. Yeah. It was a lot better. So having that kind of <laughs> yes. structure, you know, I have to come up with the, the instructions first um, before I can pass it on. And so as we've been adding new, cause I have a huge list of things she could do for me, mm-hmm. but I've been adding slowly as I ha- make sure I have a process to hand off to her so that she can take it over. I'm laughing because when you say do this thing, that's that's the kind of that's the way that I've communicated in the past to my team too. And you know whether it's a development team or a customer service team or marketing or and that and of course the irony is that here I own a company that's all about delegation, and yet I'm doing such a terrible job at times of, of <laughs> delegating effectively. Yeah. And and really, I think at the heart of delegating effectively is good communication. In fact, mm-hmm. at the heart of any good relationship is good communication, but simply saying do this thing and, and we have photographers come to us and and essentially doing that very or saying that very thing you know here here are my images make them look good uh, essentially right. uh and or just kind of a general make it look light and airy or make it look uh contrasty mm-hmm. of course innate to that style that they're hoping that we then apply to their images are a lot of different moving parts there's a lot mm-hmm. of detail nuance and without specific instruction, the reality is that we're probably going to fail. Mm-hmm. And so it's super important. And, and I'm glad that you highlighted this to first understand what it is that you want to the extent that you can lay out detailed instructions. You mentioned writing out a detailed instruction or, or sharing detailed instructions for anybody listening in, whether it's delegating, editing, or admin work, email, or or album design, whatever it might be, you have to be clear about what it is that you want to the extent that you're able to communicate in great detail the process involved and getting to that place before you can effectively delegate. Otherwise, it's going to be a super frustrating experience. And and we've mm-hmm. seen this. Photographers will come to Photographer's Edit and and they just kind of you know dump the images on us and give us maybe some basic instructions and they get frustrated when they don't get a great finished result. The more information, the more detailed information that we get, the more effectively um, we can process their work a and then if that photographer is willing to give us feedback and and kind of work develop a working relationship understand that there's ongoing communication needed for a good working relationship in the process of delegation that's super important too and 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 so again tanya i'm glad that you highlight the fact that it's been a process yeah yeah and yeah like you said not just giving up because oh well that didn't work right um you know we have a meeting and we're like, well, what didn't work? What could we change to make it better? You know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And I've had to, I mean, I'm doing this in my personal life actively, even right now. Um, and certainly I'm working on doing a better job of it in in my business life and my professional life as well. But that very question that you just asked, what can we do better or what can I do better? Um, I I'm trying to get to this place where consistently I'm asking myself professionally, personally, what could I have done better in this situation? Yeah, I might be frustrated with how it played out or I might be frustrated with this person or the way they handled this situation or the way that they responded to me, whatever it is. But could I have approached the conversation more effectively? Could I have you know, developed a clearer set of instructions? Um, that I use the wrong tone of voice, whatever it might be, could I have done something better? It takes setting ego aside, but it's it's we can only get better if we are willing to ask that question. And again, you, you've highlighted so many good points here. I'm glad that you bring that to light as well. Let's let's switch gears though. Talk to me about a super impactful business or self help book that you've read or listened to in the last few years that you'd recommend to our listeners. Oh wow, I've read so many. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of a self help junkie. I guess. Yes, I feel you. Um, <laughs> The most recent one I read, well, this year I've been focusing on increasing my revenue and profitability, kind of my thoughts around money. Okay. So I recently read The Secrets of a Millionaire Mindset. That's it. Oh, okay. And then um, Jen Sincero's You Are a Badass at Making Money, Yes. which I thought was hilarious. I listened to her audio <laughs> and it was so funny. Um, what made it funny? I'm really curious. I don't think anybody has said that yet about that book. I just thought she was hilarious. Like her, her stories about how cheap she was and how poor she was. Like I really related with, you know, like things like washing out the Ziploc baggies and like my mom used to do that, just all these things, you know, and how she was able to shift and it's all in your mind, right? Like it's all just a way of being that you change with your thoughts. And I've kind of gone on that journey and still working on it, but I just, I guess just the way she told her story was funny to me and (laughs) 
Well, that's, I, that's I enjoyed great. it more than the other one. The the um, Secrets of the Millionaire Mindset, I had a lot of aha moments, but it was a little more dry. You know? <laughs> Fair enough. Well, we'll we'll give <laughs> we'll give our listeners options, right? We'll put both of them in the yeah. show notes, bocapodcast.com. There's, yeah. there's great stuff in both. So. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you're a badass at making money. I, if it's not, and I have to take a quick glance, but we, Haley actually put together a really cool resource for our listeners. If you go to boca, B-O-K-E-H, bookshelf.com, and it's a collection of the most popular books that have been brought to, to light on the Boca podcast and, you know, 450 plus episodes. And you're a badass at making money. I think at this point it has to be in the, in the top probably 10 or so. It definitely comes up a lot. I, I'm not sure I'd ever heard that it had a kind of a humorous slant to it too. So I'm, I'm intrigued. I may have to, I may have to go ahead and grab that book. <laughs> Maybe I just, I don't know, got her sense of humor or something. I yeah. just found myself giggling through the whole thing. And, <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> so. That's cool. Well, we'll put those in the show notes. Everybody listening in, do make sure you take advantage of the show notes. Um, you know, if, if nothing else, it's kind of a review. If you listen to the episode, the talking points from the episode are there. The links to the resources, including books that are mentioned, are there at bocapodcast.com. Make sure you take advantage of those. And shout out to Haley for putting all that together for everybody. But let me go ahead and again switch gears, Tanya, and, and let's actually get into this conversation about branding photography and actually using it as a way to generate recurring revenue. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I've asked a similar question before, but I'm, I'm really curious to get your take on this, especially this being your specialty, the, the only thing that you're doing. It, branding photography, I mean, in the last three years, two to three years or so, has become super popular. And, and I'm curious what you think is driving that. Is it social media and all these brands on social media driving the popularity of the genre, or do you think it's something else? Definitely social media. I mean, people need content every day. Um, when I first saw the need for this, social media didn't even exist, though. Hmm. So um, I was working as a graphic designer for a dental practice marketing firm. Okay. And we designed print newsletters that went out quarterly to their patients. So it's like a kind of a guerrilla marketing. It was the original content marketing, right? <laughs> but it's a printed newsletter. Um, so, and we would use the same like 10 stock photos over and over again, forever and ever. Yeah. And I hated it. <laughs> I was like, can we get some new photos? Um, and then, you know, we would want the dentist to like show their themselves. And so they would send us pictures and they were terrible. Like they took them with their phone or their point and shoot camera Yep. Uh, back in the day when we actually had those. Um, <laughs> and, or we'd say, go hire a photographer and they'd hire their wedding photographer or whatever. And they'd still be terrible, like the wrong angle and just like the wrong lens and huh. terrible lighting, yeah. you know? And I don't know if they just cheaped out or what, or, you know, I just don't think there was accessibility of photographers who worked with small businesses then. Okay. Um, and so well, I saw the need then and, um, eventually, I was like, why don't I just do this myself? Because I had several things like that. Several clients were like, hire a photographer. You're going to need great photography for these products or whatever. And they would come back with terrible photos. And I had to spend all this time Photoshopping them. I'm like, I could have gone and taken this photo myself. And <laughs> it would have been better, you know? So, But I love that it so started I, with a need. Uh, I, yeah, I think that's a, yeah. a really one of the uh, most common elements of a good entrepreneurship story is it starts with, oh, there's a need. Now I'm going to go attempt to meet that need Mm -hmm. with a service or a product or some combination of the above. Yeah. So anyway, but um, social media and online, like digital marketing, you know, Facebook ads, all that stuff has since been invented. Um, (laughs) And that's totally driving the need for it. And with digital photography, it's, you know, the barrier to entry to be a photographer was lowered. Yep. You know, all of this stuff in the last 20 years of my career has shifted. Um, and so it's just easier, you know, like 20 years ago or 30 years ago, if you wanted to hire a commercial photographer, it was a much more involved process, hmm. um, a lot more expensive, you know? So. Well, I, yeah. you got in, it sounds like kind of on the ground level. How many years now have you been doing brand photography? So I founded WorkStory. I launched it exactly five years ago, but it was two or three years before that, that I had the idea and I had been learning more. I didn't feel like I was ready to offer photography yet at that point on a commercial level, because I needed to learn about lighting and, um, you know, how to work with a commercial client on a photography. I mean, I've been doing that forever as a graphic designer. So I kind of 
knew about, you know, I, I purchased thousands of photography uh, photos as a graphic designer. So I, I kind of knew, but I, yeah, spent a couple of years developing the process before I officially launched okay. my brand five years ago. So, and, I mean, as you're getting into, you're like, here's an opportunity. You saw a need, but the genre had to be relatively appealing to you too. What were the things that were particularly appealing to you specifically getting into brand photography? Yeah. So, well, I started out, you know, shadowing wedding photographers and photographing kids and families. And I, I didn't want to have to work on weekends and in the evenings and that kind of stuff, which I found you needed to do as a portrait photographer or event photographer. And so I liked the idea of working with businesses during business hours because my, you know, my kids in general would be in school and I, you know, I like to relax in the evening (laughs) on the weekends. So, and then the flexibility, you know, I can charge a pretty high price for this. So I can do one or two shoots a week and be profitable. I don't have to do a high volume of portrait sessions or that type of thing, or cram my summer full of weddings and then have nothing for the winter. (laughs) It's like, it's an all year thing. I can fit it into my schedule. So all of those things and my background in working with businesses, you know, I missed that when I I was like, Oh, I'll try portrait photography. And I, I love talking about branding. I'll talk about marketing. I love seeing people make more money after they start, you know, using amazing photographs. So that kind of just feeds my soul, I guess. (laughs) That's great. I I think it's wonderful to play on, on our strengths and, and ultimately those areas of life that we're most familiar with, because it's easy for us to work into that. Um, mm-hmm. so I think there's great opportunity there just to kind of highlight though, you, you talked about, first of all, that the, uh, the fact that this particular genre enables you to work during the week. So it gave you flexibility in the sense that it, that you didn't have to work weekends. You could spend more time with your kids. Uh, so there was flexibility there. The second point I, I noted here was that it enables you to shoot low volume for a relatively high price point, which meant for shooting less, uh, which mm-hmm. is a really great combo. I mean, for pretty much anybody out there, I can imagine that the idea of only having a couple of shoots a week, that enabling them to sustain a business is pretty brilliant. Mm-hmm. So that's super appealing. And then again, playing on on your strengths, those areas uh, that are the industry that you were familiar with or industries you were familiar with. Um, that's interesting as well. It, talk to me though about storytelling. We were We were actually, we mentioned this in passing earlier, this idea of storytelling. But, you know, when it comes to a uh, a, a portrait. Um, you know, when we were talking about a scenic portrait, for example, with a background that plays on the idea associated with this particular brand or this business, the service that they offer, I guess I can understand that that might be a little bit more storytelling, but especially when it comes to having somebody sit in front of the camera for what could maybe be just simply called a, a headshot, how do you attach storytelling to that? Or how do you try to incorporate storytelling into a picture like that? Sure. Yeah. Well, I always say everything in the photo should be there for a reason and everything in the photo is going to communicate something. So even if if it's just a businessman sitting in front of my camera with a plain backdrop, um, what he's wearing is going to tell us something. You know? um, his facial expression is going to tell us something. His age, you know, all of those things. We're humans and we make judgments about these things. So if we have some control over what we want to communicate to people, we can adjust all of those things, right? Yeah. So if you want to look really high end, if you want to look um, really experienced, uh, just whatever. So in my planning sessions with people, I'll ask them, like, how do you want to be portrayed? And we talk about specific words. We, we always start with the words. Okay. And, you know, just, I mean, my degree is in visual communication. So <laughs> I just we just think about, you know, what could we communicate that, you know, what thing could we use to visually communicate those words? So that's where my mind is always going. And I think that's why hiring someone with a background in branding or marketing is an advantage for people in creating their photos. That's interesting. The way that you describe that, because when I, you know, when I look at a a headshot, uh, for example. And, and when I think, when, when I say headshot, I'm just thinking kind of your typical, like you were describing somebody sitting in front of the camera, either a really plain background or in some cases, and I'm even seeing this on your, your Instagram account, um, just a, like a simple brick wall in the background, not a lot mm-hmm. happening, um, to distract from the viewer's focus on the subject in front mm-hmm. of the camera. And, 
I wouldn't have thought of those as storytelling, but you're right. I mean, literally everything in that image, including the simple background, including the clothes that they're wearing, the expression on their face, um, whether they're looking at the camera or they're not looking at the camera, they can all tell a story. And we do, whether it's conscious or subconscious, we perceive or we take away certain perceptions or make certain assumptions based on what we're seeing there. That's really Mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. 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 So taking it deeper into the, you know, if we, if I am going into their office or we're choosing a location, I want to make sure everything in that photo is there for a reason. So I'm always taking out garbage cans or, (laughs) uh, you know, anything that's distracting. And I, on Facebook ads, I'm always constantly like evaluating the photos and like, Oh my gosh, that's the worst photo ever. Like, cause it doesn't match the message that they're trying to say. Like for some reason I'm seeing something in the photo that's telling a different story. Mm. And so that if you can get the image and the words to match, that is going to boost trust with, you know, cause there's, there's a distrust if they don't match. Cause we're telling someone, it's like a salesman coming up to you with this junky car telling yep. you it's this luxury car and it's, it's brand new yes. on all these things, but you're looking at it and you're like, this doesn't match right. <laughs> the description. Right. So that's really fascinating. Yeah. And and you're right. It can be, if we're not intentional, to, to borrow an earlier word, in the image that we're associating with the brand, it can be a bit confusing. So mm-hmm. you said that the conversation, that there's a consultation, pri- I guess, prior to the shoot. And so you're discussing kind of their end goal for this photo session during that consultation. Is that right? Yeah. So the planning process, I take my clients through I say is a half the value of what they're getting because Hmm. um, it's a process. Like it's uh, (laughs) I guess I'll just walk you through. So usually we start with a call, you know, when they're interested, I tell them what's all included. If they want to book, we schedule a planning meeting before the meeting, they get a questionnaire from me and a contract, all that stuff. And the questionnaire is the same questionnaire. Basically I would send to a client. I'm going to design a logo for, Okay, like, you know, it's, it's all about their brand and their goals and their target market, that kind of stuff. Um, so I review that in advance and then we meet up and in the planning meeting, we brainstorm all the ideas of, you know, what shots do they need? How are they going to use them? Because if they're going to have a billboard, it's going to be way different than if they're going to do a Facebook ad or a print ad or a business card or whatever, you know? So I need to know how they're going to use those photos, what they want to communicate And then we'll talk about some of those ideas for the storytelling part. And I help them come up with um, an itinerary. We talk about what they're going to wear. I'll usually do a Pinterest board of visual ideas for both of us to kind of, um, you know, get an idea of what we want to create. And then if we need to get models or book locations, all of that kind of stuff, I arrange for all of that. Uh, so it's a lot of work beforehand. And if clients want to skip that part, I find we don't have as good of an outcome. You know, if they're like, just show up, we'll take care of everything. <laughs> Come take pictures. I found we don't have as good of a turnout with the photos. They aren't as happy with them or we just didn't get everything that they needed. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, if you got into a place in your business where you're, you're already like, like you're saying to them, Hey, if you're not willing to do this consultation, then we may not be a good fit. Because I I mean, I know that in individual conversations with photographers, to go back to what I was saying earlier about photographers edit, at this stage in the game, I'm I'm really straightforward with photographers and saying, hey, if you're not, you know, we have this whole section on the editing style, uh, or the editing style uh, portion of their account where they can share what it is they want very specifically in great detail. And we encourage them to do that. And and I can literally say to them, if you don't do this, you may not mm-hmm. have a great experience. You're likely not going to have a great experience with our company. It's not because we're not good at what we do. It's because to have the best possible experience, we need to have this conversation, if you will, about what it is that you're looking for. It sounds very mm-hmm. similar to your business model. Yeah, totally. I mean, I have a couple packages where it's more of like, you know, they just want a couple headshots or uh, it's like a mini session where we don't do okay as much of the planning, but I'll send them some stuff to read in advance or watch a video. (laughs) So if they watch it or not is up to them. But um, yeah, for the most part, I mean, my signature package, you have to do the planning meeting or we don't move forward with your shoot. Yes. (laughs) Okay. So it starts then in that planning meeting, number one, with setting goals. Secondly, you develop based on those goals and itinerary, 
third, you you said you handled the logistics, which of course is wonderful. The client doesn't have to think about that. Mm -hmm. Take us then to the next step, which I guess would be the shoot. And before you even start shooting, are you are you doing something in particular to set the tone for that session, especially for somebody who's not used to being in front of the camera to help them relax in front of the camera? Yeah, well, ironically, I think the plan is the thing <laughs> that puts people at ease, right? Like I should okay. put this folder, my brand color is pink. I have these pink folders. Yeah. I have the itinerary printed out. I have the shot list printed out. I have our Pinterest board printed out. Um, I lay it out, you know, we kind of go over the plan. We'll look at their clothes again, kind of choose which outfits to go with what, um, you know, each thing on the list. Um, if I'm working with a larger team, which I often do, I don't necessarily, you know, we don't have tons of outfits, but we've talked about what to wear. And, you know, if someone didn't iron their shirt, we might bring out the steamer, <laughs> whatever, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, we just kind of go over the plan, you know, if it is a larger group and I've only been talking with the marketing manager or something, we'll gather everyone around, tell them the plan, you know, oftentimes with that itinerary, each person will know exactly what time they're supposed to show up at right. which room or whatever. So I think just having that plan makes everyone feel at ease because they know what to expect. Interesting. Okay. So they're not, and I guess they've had the opportunity then ideally to also have a conversation with you as well. So they know what it feels like to interact with you. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of that can help ease the the minds of those subjects who are going to be in front of the camera. Okay, so you review the itinerary and and then we get to the actual shoot. What is can you just describe in detail what that shooting process looks like? Yeah, well it's different for every client, I guess, because every brand is different and yeah. every plan is different. But for the most part, we just start shooting based on our our plan and um I try to stay on schedule. I have an assistant that helps me with lighting and carrying gear and she keeps me on track with the time and gets drinks for us and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. She also will shoot some behind the scenes photos if she's not busy doing something else, which is really awesome for my marketing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if we're doing video too, that adds another element. Um, you know, we're usually kind of shooting video and photo together and then, yeah, we just try to move through as quickly as possible. As I mentioned before, you know, most of these are professionals. They want to get it done in a timely manner. Right. And it's a little different. Like if, if I'm working with a personal brand, just one person and we're shooting in their home or something, it's a little different than if I'm working with a team of lawyers or something in their office, you know, mm. it's a, a little bit different vibe. And I've just yep. learned to communicate differently with each of those yeah. um, groups. And like you mentioned before, putting people at ease, I just, kind of have a natural knack for that. Like people will say, I feel so comfortable with you. I don't know if that, that's been learned or if I just have a, I don't know. I'm a pretty easygoing, chill person. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Oh, props to you for that. I mean, and, and actually I'm curious because this has come up. Have, have you, do you consider yourself an introvert or extrovert? I'm totally an introvert, but I, I like people. I mean, I, I don't like to go to parties or dance clubs or anything, but the one-on-one -on -one interaction for me ah. I really like. So yeah. I think that's actually been uh, good for me for photography because um, actually when I was a graphic designer working at home alone in my basement, I was <laughs> feeling depleted. You know, I was like, sure. I gotta, I gotta hang out with some people. Yes. So photography for me, I mean, it, it does zap me. Like when I get home, I'm, I'm drained, yeah. but in the moment I'm energized and I like connecting with the people and especially the one-on-one -on -one, um, is is great. I love it. So during that shoot, or I guess more specifically the shoot itself, how much time, and I know you said it does vary from shoot to shoot, especially if in the context of an, an office for lawyers, for example, but mm -hmm. roughly what do you average as far as the amount of time that you're spending fo actually photographing? Yeah, I try not to go over four hours. I've just found oh, wow. like okay. four, four to five hours. It will, it depends too, right? Like if, sure. if we're just creating five images or something for an ad campaign, we're done in two hours or less. Um, but if I'm doing a full package for like a, a personal brand, we'll do a half a day. I've done a full day a few times and it's just a lot. <laughs> it's just, everyone's tired by the end and um, they're done. I, so I feel like kind of four hours, especially if someone's getting their hair and makeup done or something, yeah. we need that time. Um, but I've gotten a lot faster over time too, as I've gotten better with lighting and, and the whole process down, we're able to get stuff done 
in a few hours, just depending on the client. You know, I think some who really want to get their money's worth, they feel like, you know, let's milk it for all it's worth. Because yeah. I, I don't really limit it to a time unless they bought, it, you know, a package that's based on, you know, it's a quick package or something for an hour. But um, for the most part, if someone books my main package, I'm like, we'll take as much time as we need. But I try to get it done in, in half a day or so. Well, I mean, the process itself seems relatively straightforward. You talk about setting goals first and then developing an mm-hmm. itinerary, itinerary based on the goals. Um, of course, logistics, you're handling yourself. And then on the day of the shoot, you're actually reviewing that itinerary with the client or clients. And then you're actually photographing based on that itinerary. I, I want to get to, well, actually, in just a little bit, we're going to actually share with our listeners information about a, a course. I mean, you're you're actually teaching how to... Uh, implement this particular genre of photography in photography businesses for photographers. We're going to share that information for you listeners here in just a little bit, because I know that was kind of a general overview. You may want to know more details, but I do want to, before we get to that, Tanya, um, I want to touch on what you know we highlighted at the very beginning we were going to discuss here, which is this notion of recurring revenue. Mm-hmm. What, first of all, enables you to, or I guess more specifically, what enables branding photography to be a source of recurring revenue in contrast to other genres? Yeah. So, well, I've learned there's several ways you could do it based on what you want to offer, right? So okay. number one is just having clients come to you year after year, which I have found to be the case. I have, you know, clients, they're like, okay, time to update our images for our ad campaign. We're doing a new one every year. And, you know, my, like my September was a hundred percent clients I've worked with before. I wow. don't have to like go find new clients. They all just booked me because, you know, they wanted to use me again. So, and the, all of those had hired me three or four years in a row. So that's one way, right? Like if you just had loyal clients that came to you year after year, you don't have to do as much marketing to get new ones. So, and then also with the social media and that kind of stuff, businesses need images on a regular basis. You know, I found several of my clients, we did such a good job with the planning and executing that they had photos to use for a year, but you could have packages where you're only creating enough for them for one quarter or each month or something like that. And then I've also found with my graphic design background, clients asking me, do you manage social media? And for a long time, I was like, no, (laughs) you can go hire this other person to do that. But for a few clients, I decided to take that on. So we are creating content like photo, video content, and then scheduling it out for them uh, on their social media. So if you have a background in design or communications of some sort, that is a way that you can get recurring revenue. Or maybe you just do the photos for them and there's another person, you know, a social media management company or something that does the the actual execution. Sure. Sure. Okay. But but you mentioned first annual photos for ads. Secondly, then regular fresh photos for social media. So here are two opportunities for recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. Are are there any other, any other ways that you've been able to generate recurring revenue as far as the actual photography is concerned? The corporations are looking for businesses are looking for, I guess, repeat photo sessions for Mm -hmm. the purpose of their business. Yeah. One of my students I just talked to today in my course Uh, a hospital network has hired her to do headshots of their new physicians Ah, like every time they get a new one so every time they get a new one they call her she comes in and she's now working on uh getting a retainer with them which is another thing like a retainer that i mean that's basically what you're doing when you're creating you know recurring revenue so um, i have a retainer with a commercial real estate agent Um, he pays me the same amount every month to take pictures of his properties. So that's one, you know, if you can get some kind of retainer where you're making the same amount every month for a certain amount of work. Um, and then, you know, that money is automatically going to come to you every month. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I guess that leads me to really my main, uh, the last main question for today, but that is how do you then set the stage for set the precedent for repeat photo sessions with these commercial clients? Are they already thinking this way? Or are you educating them? And they're like, Oh, yeah, you're right. I should probably come back in and, you know, in six months or a year or three months, whatever it might Mm be for these. How do you set that precedent? Yeah, so all of mine, I mean, started out with just a single photo shoot, right? I didn't go in proposing 
right away, you know, like hire me every month. Um, <laughs> so I think that can be a little scary for a client. You know, I'll hear from other branding photographers, like I haven't gotten any retainers. No one wants to hire me. And I'm like, well, have you actually done a shoot for them yet? Hmm. Like just do a one-time shoot. Okay. And then they'll love you, <laughs> you know, and then you just kind of either propose it if you see a need or, you know, sometimes they bring it up with the, with my real estate client. Um, he was hiring me pretty much every month. And finally I was like, Hey, do you want to just, you know, choose an amount that makes sense for both of us? So we're not having, cause I hate having to like keep track of my time. You know, like I, I was charging by, by the hour, which I don't do for most people, but for him I was. And I was like, this is, you know, kind of the average for the last year. Do you want to just do a retainer? So um, it's, it's a conversation and a relationship with your client that you're building. And so do the first shoot. I mean, that, that seems like kind of a natural first step, have a conversation, Mm -hmm. um, whether it's during that first shoot or maybe following that first shoot. But you also mentioned earlier that you have different packages. Is that right? Yeah. Well, kind of, I don't really have like, like you can't go to my website and see like packages. It's more of like, I know my numbers. And after I have a conversation with a client, I can recommend what they need and how much it's going to cost. I, you know, so I, I guess I create a package for each of my clients, but I have kind of standard ones that I offer specifically okay. based on what people need, you so, know? So I guess more specifically have a conversation about the, the potential packages that would enable that recurring revenue or uh, allow them to be able to come back on a regular basis and get the images that they need. That's interesting. I wonder if it would, do do you feel like it would change anything about how often you book that recurring work? If the packages were available up front or they knew that was an option up front, they, they went in knowing, Hey, if I work with Tanya, um, I know that, uh, I'm going to hire her for a year. Or do you think that they would shy away? Maybe. I mean, I just kind of tend to design something that seems like a no brainer for them. Got you know? it. Like, okay. I mean, if they were hired, if they hired me for an, you know, a certain amount of photos three months in a row and it costs, you know, $3,000 each time. Um, and then I say, Hey, if you're willing to sign a contract with me to hire me every month, and it's only going to be $2,000 a month, you know, I'm willing to give you a little bit of discount. If you'll commit to a year, would that be beneficial to you? And they're like, of course. So, you know, making it a no brainer for them, like it's a win-win for me because I get recurring income. They know they're going to, you know, have someone show up and do a good job every time. And then they, you know, save a little bit of money over the, over the long haul of the year. So. Well, we, okay. we've been able to kind of yeah. cover a variety of, of elements or angles on this, this idea of offering brand photography and what is involved or what may be involved, especially when it comes to creating recurring revenue. But as I had mentioned earlier, you do teach a course to photographers about how to even develop a branding photography business and or brand okay. photography business. Can you just share a little information about that with our listeners? Sure. Yeah. Well, when I started this, I couldn't find anyone to mentor me that was working with local businesses in this way. <laughs> And I kind of had to invent it, you know, like I would even go, you know, reach out to commercial photographers in my area. They didn't, they were very tight lipped about how much to charge or I like, I just couldn't find any information. I didn't invent it myself. And so um, I just really wanted to share this with other photographers who wanted to work with local businesses and, uh, and didn't want to travel. You know, Mm -hmm. I've seen several branding photography courses where like work with influencers, but you got to fly around the world to meet them where they are right. or, you know, have this grand package in Paris or something. And I'm like, I have three kids though. I want to work <laughs> on a regular basis sure. with businesses who need this, you know, and from my background in working with dentistry, it's like, I know small businesses need this. They have a budget for it. They know they need to spend money on marketing. And so I, yeah, I teach my whole business model, all of my back end like workflows and emails and contracts and how to approach businesses and, how to close a sale and then the, that whole planning process and the shoot process and tips for shooting in tiny little dentist offices, <laughs> just all the things that I've encountered for people to have a successful business doing what I do. Well, we're going to link to that information uh, or, or really directly to the website. It's workstoryeducation.com for anybody listening in. Um, we'll put that in the show notes as well at bocapodcast.com. You can learn more 
there at the website. But Tanya, I really appreciate you hanging out with me today. This has been a, a really kind of fun, easy conversation. And mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate you sharing with our listeners. Will you just remind them one more time where they can find you online and then, of course, your social media as well? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, so Work Story Education um, is also on Facebook and Instagram. And then me personally, I'm on LinkedIn as Tanya Goodall Smith. Um, and then I do have a Facebook group that's called Rock Your Branding Photography Biz if anyone wants to come join that and we have free trainings and kind of support there as well for free. So. Okay. Well, we're going to put all this in the show notes. I was actually Perfect. typing out your, uh, your other Instagram account here and in, in my notes, but um, we'll put all of this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com for everybody listening in. Make sure you go check it out. Follow Tanya, ask questions. Um, and thanks once again for sharing with all of us, Tanya. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at bocapodcast.com. Make sure to visit our sponsors, photographersedit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.